I'd like to see somebody's face here so I can make sure that everything's are happening. Um, Bill, you took yourself off, I guess, huh? Let's see. Oh, Whoa. still here. There you are. Why don't you leave us your, your face on, Bill, so I can see your face. And if there's um, any questions, could you have people ask in the chat and you monitor the chat and just, just wave your hand like this if there's, if there's a question and I'll be happy to answer it? Sure thing. Great. Okay. Wonderful. And let me see. I'm just going to put the two of us on here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, uh, sci <clears throat> science and beekeeping. And I, I run the website, Scientific Beekeeping. But science is not about test tubes and lab coats and all that. Science is about a way of thinking and about a way of answering uh, questions based upon evidence. And with beekeeping, beekeepers had things pretty well figured out after uh, Langstroth. Uh, and these, the, the beekeepers in the 1800s, you read um, how much they knew. They really understood their bees uh, very, very well. But as anybody who has kept bees for very long realizes, there is a lot to learn about bees. And I realize that I'm going to uh, die with more questions than I ever uh, started with uh, in beekeeping. And one of the uh, terms, a good phrase for business management is that the most dangerous words in business are because that's how we've always done it. Uh, we, we are continuing to learn and improve and new things happen. We get new parasites, new pathogens, new environmental uh, things happening, the climate's changing. So beekeeping will change and we need to change with it and we can figure out how to, how to do it. This is the uh, uh, scientific publications over time. Um, with Apis mellifera um, uh, in, the, in the title. And you see, there weren't very many until we got um, started getting some problems with uh, colony collapse disorder, the old type of colony collapse disorder, not what they call colony collapse disorder now, which is mainly lack of uh, our poor varroa management. But back then we had a, an event that started about 2003 and colonies started dying uh, along with the uh, invasion of Nozema serrani. And it got the public's attention. And then you can see the publications just take off like crazy. So we have a lot of, of, of practical questions. I always have practical questions. We make our living with keeping our bees. So we have um, practical questions about what we should do uh, all the time. My sons are always asking me and I'm asking my own. So to get meaningful answers, we use the scientific uh, method. The scientific method is you, you start off with a, a question up here at the top and um, um, you do some background research. Somebody may have already answered that question. And now with the internet available, uh, it's not too hard to, uh, <laughs> to find information, but be careful on the information. Make sure you, you go to a site that actually has legitimate uh, answers, not just somebody who's just um, talking out of their hat. And then you uh, construct a hypothesis um, and then test it with an experiment. That hypothesis is that you um, suspect that this is the reason that something is, is happening. And then you, you go through, um, through the experiment and then analyze and then analyze and draw conclusions, and then you can communicate results. And that a lot of what I do is communicating results of my own uh, research. Now there's different kinds of research and depending upon how deeply you want to get involved with this. So I'm gonna go through different ones right here. So, uh, first, observational studies, then exploratory experiments, or confirmatory experiments to, to confirm something that uh, maybe somebody else has done. And this one right here is a, a big one because a lot of the things you read about beekeeping, beekeeping management are based upon one single study or one person saying something and then it gets parroted over and over and over again without anybody ever confirming it or replic replicating it. So um, um, I do uh, like to do some confirmatory experiments and then comparative trials. trials. Um, this is a lot this like consumer like reports um, um, testing. And I, uh, I just finished some large comparative trials. So let's just go through a few of these. So an observational study. So what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll tell you the question of the type of, of study here. So uh, what is the amount of mite immigration into my hives in late summer? People are always talking about mite immigration, but there's been very, very few uh, studies um, so um, I performed one, I have not yet published it. I've been too, I'm too far behind to publish it, but in 2018, I did this. So what you do is uh, you uh, treat your hives with synthetic miticides. I use two uh, independent ones, uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, Amitraz and fluvalinate. Now, we haven't used a synthetic miticide in our operation since 2001. So our mites are very susceptible to synthetic miticides. By putting these two in, I can completely zero out the mite population in the hive. We do this in advance until there's no more mites whatsoever in that hive. There's none in the sticky board. There's none at all. Um, uh, if you look at the brood. So now you have a mite-free, a zero mite colony. Any mites that you find on a sticky board from this came, uh, point on had to come from outside the hive. That'd be mite immigration. So what they did is a bee drifted to that hive and the mite got exposed to the uh, uh, chemicals here yeah. and it drops mm -hmm. the sticky board. So you go ahead and you put sticky boards into yeah. these, these hives. R5 is receiver hive five. Then you keep track. So these are uh, uh, semi-weekly counts. Uh, uh, every uh, Twice a week, we do a count of the number of mites on the sticky board. So here's your mite count on the, ax on the uh, Y axis, and here's the date on the X axis right here. And then I also did a cumulative count. So I add up all these over on the right-hand axis here. So you see in, in this hive right here, we got over 500 mites between the middle of September and pretty much the middle of November right here. So um, this is um, one way to see, what, is there a mite immigration happening in my hives? And yes, <laughs> this one did. On average, we did it for a number of hives. We got about 250 mites on average coming over that uh, period of time coming in. My guess is if we had done it the year before, we would have had over a thousand mites coming in because we had a um, huge drift. Interesting thing was, um, they did not appear to be happening from hives in our own yard. We had nine hives set up to collapse from Varroa and we had marked the bees and uh, the mite immigration was apparently not coming from those hives. It was coming from uh, other uh, uh, hives um, around. Not from, there's very few beekeepers around me. So um, we're guessing it was largely from escaped swarms that are, uh, are become mite factories. And here's, here's for a number of hives right here. And what I did is I, I put on the distance from the, uh, we had set up nine hives to collapse from Varroa and uh, thinking that those would be the source of the mites. And uh, <clears throat> so the red uh, uh, line right here was a hive at 15 feet away from the collapsed hives. The blue were, they were 60 feet away and the greens were 500 uh, feet away. And you can see that it, uh, there wasn't any correlation between the, uh, the distance from the collapsing hives and the number of mites uh, coming in. So this is a very interesting study. So it answered the question about the amount of mite immigration coming in. Okay, now there's exploratory experiments versus confirmatory experiments. So exploratory means you're just saying, let's go for a fishing expedition. Let's see what we can find out here. So we'll come back to confirmatory experiments. Um, so let's take a look right here. And I'm moving around my, hang on, I'm gonna hide this bar here. Hide video panel. No, that's not what I want to do. Hide. I want to hide my menu bar down here. Hide. Floating. There we go. Okay. So exploratory experiments. Let's just say if I put mint leaves in my hive every day, what will I observe? Okay. You're not. You're not thinking, and they're going to do anything. You're just wondering what they would do. So you look for uh, cor correlations. But understand that that necessarily doesn't mean uh, causality. So you, what you're going to do is measure everything you can possibly th think of. Um, you know, do you see dead bees in front of the hive? Do you see, uh, does it look like the brood rearing decreases? Do you see dead larvae? Do you see bees doing some kind of strange dance? So that'd be exploratory. Confirmatory is you might have a hypothesis. Your hypothesis being, I expect that placing mint leaves in the hive will decrease the varroa infestation. Now what you do is you're gonna uh, test that against a null hypothesis. Null hypothesis means it doesn't make any difference. So you're gonna see if it does make a difference. So you then would compare the change in mite count. So you actually have the, the metric that you're gonna look for, which would be mite counts. Where this one, you're looking at everything because it's exploratory. This one is confirmatory. So let's do, uh, first you're gonna do some uh, exploratory preliminary research. So I do a lot of this. So this is one I just did recently. I'm curious about uh, feeding pollen sub into uh, hives. And somebody asked me, a couple of people asked me, well, can you feed dry pollen sub inside a hive? So I was curious. Um, so the question is, how do bees respond to dry powdered diets offered under the hive cover? So I set up a hive 
with a rimmer uh, above the under the hive cover and then put a piece of glass over that rim and insulation over the top of that. So I can now look down without disturbing the bees through that glass, lift off the insulation and watch the bees. Then put petri dishes here. Um, this one I put um, uh, uh, pollen, uh, corbicular pollen collected from bees out of the freezer. Uh, here I put some dried uh, powdered pollen sub. Somebody else has suggested mixing it with powdered sugar. So this one, I mixed the pat pollen sub with powdered sugar half and half and this one i mix natural pollen half and half powdered sugar and then i put in a, a control here of just powdered sugar which i know that bees do like and then then spent hours popping this lid off day after day and observing the behavior of bees in here and looking at their feeding preferences you can see right here they clearly preferred the natural pollen they cleaned it out first and then the pollen with the powdered sugar was actually less attractive than the straight pollen and then they hopped on the powdered sugar here. And then they finally started taking the rest of the dry sub. And the last one was the dry sub with the powdered sugar. Their behaviors were very interesting too. Initially on the dusty ones, they would, uh, the bees would come up and they would get it on, the dust on their bodies and they would pack it on their corbicula, on their legs. And then they would carry it down on their legs. So these were bees acting as foragers. But a lot of them were bouncing against the glass. And if I lifted the glass slightly, they would fly immediately right outside at the top of the hive and then drop straight down and go into the entrance of the hive rather than just walking down because they, they were still acting as foragers. And once you get a pollen load, you fly home and then come in the entrance. So I found that to be very interesting. After a few days, as uh, humidity, uh, uh, removed the dust of this and they, and they uh, swept the dust off, they changed behavior and now they were picking it up in their mandibles, and I did not look closely enough to see whether they were consuming it or carrying it out as trash. So what I would have to do is pick up these bees as they're walking away, and I'll, I'll do that uh, next time I try this one, um, and uh, uh, look in their guts and see if they're actually consuming it or not, or use their fluorescent tracer and see whether or not they actually store it in the combs down below. So this would be exploratory preliminary research. And I learned a lot just by doing this. This wasn't a, in a trial or anything. This was just exploration. Um, another one, I was curious whether a uh, natural mite drop on a sticky board, whether it's affected by temperature or humidity. So I collected uh, mite, uh, uh, mite, mite drops. So this is your, um, your mean mite drop from a bunch of hives. I, I monitored day by day. So every day went out and did it. And then this is your uh, maximum temperature for the day. There's your average temperature for the 24 hours. And there's your uh, minimum humidity uh, right here. And as you can see, the mite drop did not correlate with any of those things. So um, that pretty much answered my question that there wasn't a, a correlation between either temperature or humidity and mite drop. OK, then there's confirmatory experiments. You test a claim. I do this a lot for companies. Um, or if beekeepers ask me questions about a claim, say somebody's selling a product to beekeepers and they make a claim that it's going to do this for your hive. Well, then um, if enough people ask me that, I will often go ahead and test that claim. And then I publish them on my website. So also claims that I see that maybe I'm curious about. So one is that um, the sugar shake uh, for a varroa uh, uh, assessment that um, and it's on most of the websites, the university websites says the reason it works is because when you roll the bees in the powdered sugar, they get agitated, that heats that they heat up their wing muscle, heat up their bodies, and the heating of their body causes them to release from the bees and they get powdered sugar on their feet and they fall down. So I was curious about that. So I talked to a few of the researchers who had put that on their websites. And I said, oh, um, could you tell me where the study is that actually showed that the bees heat up? And um, <laughs> I kind of got blanks from everybody. So I said, well, was that just an unfounded assumption they did that? Somebody just make that up? There was that actually data. So I thought, well, that's not a, hard, not a difficult experiment. So I uh, took samples of bees and, and, and I rolled them in powdered sugar. Um, in fact, here, this is a quote from one of the university websites. The sugar acts as an irritant and the bees will generate heat when trying to remove the sugar. It's the heat that dislodges the bromides from the bees. Well, that's easy to test. You just stick thermometers inside them. So I used a thermistor right in the middle of those bees and also an infrared thermometer right here to look at them from all angles. 
and their temperature never rose <laughs> at all. <laughs> so that that claim, that explanatory claim, which is published all over the place, uh, seemed to be something somebody just pulled out of their hat um, because it made sense rather than actually ever taking a thermometer and checking it. Okay, confirmatory experiment. In the alcohol wash, um, we were using 70% alcohol. Then we found out we could buy it at the dollar store cheaper. Then we saw there was 50% alcohol at the dollar store. So we said, well, let's try it. And did a couple of my washes and mites fell off. We said, great. Now let's just use the 50%. It's a whole lot cheaper. But then I wondered, did we should we really, is it really <laughs> okay to use that? Will that affect the uh, rate of mite drop? Because I assume that based upon uh, chemistry and physics, that um, the more water in the um, alcohol is less dense than water. So the more water in that, the more dense it would be and the, the slower the mites would drop. So I wanted to confirm that that actually was the case. So I, I, I put some um, mites into, um, into water and, uh, and, and let them uh, get wet and let them sink in, in the water. <laughs> And then I slowly added salt a little bit of time and stirred it into the water until the mites, the first few mites started to float. And at the point where the mites, most of the mites were suspended at neutral buoyancy inside the water without floating or sinking, then I could read, read the density of that. I could figure out what, what the density of a mite is, okay? So then I, could, I knew the density of a mite, density of water is one. Density of a mite is 1.1, slightly more. <clears throat> Density of isopropyl, 50% isopropyl alcohol is down here, 70% is here, and 91% is more. And the, the greater the difference in density, so the mites will sink at a relatively slow rate in water, but theoretically they should sink faster in a higher proof alcohol. So we said, so I said, well, how long will it take them to sink in my mite wash cups? So I measured the, uh, the distance that they had to sink. It was two and a half inches right here. So now we have, and we know how far they have to sink. And we set up a graduated cylinder with a two and a half inch start line and finish line. And then we picked up mites uh, one at a time, uh, powder sugared them off, let them drop into the alcohol, whatever concentration we filled this full of. And the, uh, they would, uh, powder sugar would dissolve quickly. The mites would start to sink. Now they're gonna accelerate as they sink until they reach uh, um, an equilibrium uh, at maximum velocity. We found out in the first inch, they've already reached maximum velocity and change. Then you start the stopwatch when they hit here, there's a mite sinking and you stop the stopwatch right there and you time the difference. And then you graph it out. So for 91% alcohol, this is your uh, number of replicates I, I did for each one. <clears throat> this is your number of seconds to sink that two and a half inches. And the average value for 91% alcohol was about two and a half seconds. For 70% alcohol, about four seconds. And for 50% alcohol, it took closer to five seconds on average. So yeah, it made a big difference. They just think twice as fast in the 91% alcohol the 50% alcohol. So if you want to do your mite washes fast, you're a heck of a lot better using 91% alcohol than 50% alcohol because they're going to sink a lot faster. So just an example of a simple experiment to answer that question. Okay, let's look at the main error that beekeepers make when running an experiment. So for example, a few years ago, we, we rear a lot of queens, about 500 a day every, in the springtime. And some weeks we get a whole bunch of them dying from black queen cell virus. We see the sides of the queen cells turn black and we take, take them, uh, uh, open them up and the uh, uh, mature like 15 star larvae or the pupae uh, die and they turn, they turn black. So I asked, a number of experts and authorities and queen breeders, you know, what, what, if there's anything we could do about that? And they said, oh, well, we, you treat them with oxytetracycline and uh, our, you know, teramycin or fumagillin because fumagillin is, um, affects nosema. And nosema, there apparently possibly one study from Bailey from years ago said uh, nosema and black queen cell virus may have an association. And when I questioned, I said, well, an antibiotic is for bacteria, not for viruses. And they go, yeah, we know that, but eh, everybody says it works. <laughs> so I mixed up sugar syrup with oxytetracycline and with fumadil B both. 
and fed them to a number of the cell millers. And sure enough, in a few days, the problem went away. No more black queen cell virus. So what did we learn? Anybody, what did I learn? Or what questions do you need to ask me? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, maybe I have to unmute you. Oh, gosh. Let me see if I, oh, I need to escape. I'm not sure. Do I need to, if I can, un are you able to speak, Bill? Yeah, I don't see, yeah, any, I don't see uh, any, anything in the chat. Okay, go ahead, Bill, take a shot. What did I learn? Or what do you need to ask? I fed them the, the syrup with the several colonies with the fumigil in it and the oxytetracycline. And after a few days, we had no more problems with black queen cell virus. Looks like it Looks works, like it doesn't, works. It? doesn't it? Okay. What was your control? What was the effect on ah, the Ah, what was the control? In the control hives, it also went away. So we learned nothing. <laughs> okay, this is the problem that a lot of beekeepers fail to ask about the control. That Bill treats all of his hives with X, whatever X is, and they make a great honey crop. And Bill attributes that great honey crop to treating them with X. But he never, run, he never ran a control group. So he really learned nothing. And I hear this from beekeepers over and over and over again. They do what they think is an experiment. But if you don't run a control group, you can't learn anything because you're not comparing it to the control group. So that, that's the, if you get anything out of this presentation, understand you can't test anything unless you run a control to compare it to. So I do on my website have tips for citizen scientists. And I'm going to pick up some of the um, um, uh, pages off that for you to take a look at. So let's just say we're doing a, an experiment, a classic experiment, test group versus a control group. You want to make sure they differ by only a single variable. You're only going to change one thing. Everything else has to be perfect. And I know a lot of times we're running experiments and my sons will say, oh, dad, um, let's see. Well, can we feed these guys, you know, a little bit here and not the other ones? I said, no, that's not part of the experiment that, that adds a variable. Well, even opening a hive and looking at it and smoking it, that adds a variable. So you're gonna look at one hive, you gotta open and smoke all the hives in the experiment. Otherwise you're adding a variable. So you gotta be very careful that uh, you can't have one group on one side of the yard and one group on the other side of the yard because that adds a variable. You may also, add, and then on your uh, control groups, you may do a, a positive control or a negative control. So let me talk about, um, I'll come back to those. So first thing you want to do for any experiment is, and I, I talked to a lot of grad students and other researchers about this, and I said, first thing you do, you define the question you want to answer. And take a week, if it takes you that long, to get that question, and then write that on the wall in indelible ink. And then anything you do in that experiment, you look at that question written on the wall. And if there, you have a question what to do in the experiment and it is not directly involved with answering that question, then it's not necessary. Also make sure that you will be able to answer that question. So um, uh, on the experiment and you don't leave anything out. So for example, I'm putting blue here, um, the, how I would fill this out. Will feeding pollen sub benefit the buildup of nukes? My hypothesis is, Additional feeding will allow them to grow more ap uh, rapidly. So the treatment that I'll test will be the provision of pollen sub and the predicted effect will that be that colony strength will be greater in the fed colonies. So now, now you, um, th that's my question and that's how I'm gonna break it down. You wanna break it down before you start. The biggest mistake I see in experiments in a lot of published research is they didn't take the time to really design the experiment well. And then they're six months into the experiment and they realize, oh my God, we screwed up. But they don't do it again. They just go ahead and publish it even though they know that they screwed up on it. <clears throat> okay, so write down your introduction and your, your ob objective, um, uh, what you wanna, wanna do. Okay, now be realistic what you're actually gonna be able to do. And uh, it's easy to be a little bit too ambitious. Okay, so the three metrics that are most practical to beekeepers are 
colony uh, and what makes you money is the only two things that make you money in, in beekeeping, and that's colony strength and weight gain. Colony strength, that is that if you are either selling bees or supplying pollination contracts or um, trying to get them big enough to make a honey crop, that's colony strength. That's the most important metric to measure that's going to put money in your pocket. The second one is weight gain. That's your honey crop. You just weigh the whole hive. If it weighs, if it weighs more, that means that they're putting, they're putting on some bees, but mostly honey. So that's the final calculus of, of colony performance that, they, um, uh, that takes into account disease and aging and everything else. It's the weight gain. So both of these are very easy metrics to measure. The other one that we do a lot of experiments with is the Broa infestation rate. Um, so that's another easy metric right there. So you decide which of these metrics you're going to uh, measure in your experiments. Then do a background search. Read every paper you can think of on that. Use Google Scholar often helps to uh, search it out and speak to researchers um, and then on the papers you find, look at their citations and, and, and then get those citations and look at them, okay? What I often find is that my question was answered sometimes 100 years ago. Um, I found out when I was researching Nozima Serrani, when everybody was just freaking out, like it was a whole brand new thing. And there's a paper written in 1909 that told us everything we needed to know about Nozima. And nobody in any scientific paper ever cited that. It was by a USDA researcher. It was a monumental study that he spent nine years studying Nozema, and it never got cited anywhere. If anybody would have ever read that 1909 paper, they would have realized that much of their research was absolutely unnecessary. By the way, he's also the one who said, Nozema does not cause dysentery. <laughs> Even though you read in every book that Nozema causes dysentery, he was very clear. No, Nozema does not cause dysentery. So, I like to go back and read a lot of the old literature too. Okay, now your experimental design. What I recommend is you work your experiment backwards. So what you wanna do is imagine you are standing on the stage in front of a group of beekeepers and you're gonna present your results. Take a pencil and paper and draw up your graphs you're gonna show with the X axis label and the Y axis labeled and just make up dummy data, what you think is gonna happen for your test and control group and, 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 uh, and, and lay it out. And that, then you're gonna know what you need to collect as far as data and your experimental design. You work backwards from, from your final presentation. So, so do your imaginary final presentation first, writing everything down, every picture, every graph that you're gonna show and then you work your experiment backwards, figuring out, well, what do I need to do to get this data and that data there? This will help you tremendously to plan an experiment, to work it backwards from the final presentation. Okay, then your materials and methods. And this is again, where I see people just really fail to, to take the time to really figure out everything that could possibly go wrong and everything that's needed in your materials and methods. This should be thoroughly written down and, and spend a week thinking about it before you start your experiment. You're gonna define your independent and your dependent variable. So the independent variable is the one that you control and the dependent vari uh, variable is what changes due to the independent variable. So if you're gonna apply a miticide in your experiment, then the dependent variable will be the change in the mite infestation rate or maybe there's an adverse effect on the colony. So this is the independent variable that you are changing. The dependent variable is the one you're gonna be measuring. Your miticide application method, okay? Are you gonna apply at the top of the hive, the bottom of the hive, in hot weather or cold weather? And the change in dependent variable might be, a, is there a change in the amount of colony setback or the amount of brood rearing? Feeding of pollen subtypes would be independent and the dependent would be, is there a difference in the colony growth? Uh, independent application of the oxalic acid dribble. You get a change in the mite infestation. You get a change in colony strength. You get a change in weight gain. If you insulate the hive, is that will that change the survival rate or the amount of honey consumed? Uh, feed a bee health product, one of the snake oils on the market. Will, will it change colony performance, change nosema prevalence? Will it change the weight gain? Will it change colony strength? Um, or you test a, an agriculture fungicide. I, down in almonds, I work with the um, UC Experimental Orchard. 
I had them spray fungicides on half the orchard uh, during the day and half the orchard during the night. So I could see if there's a change in brood production. I haven't published that yet. And there, there wasn't any change in brood production, even though that was the recommendation for everybody. Didn't see any change at all. <clears throat> okay, so let's go through some actual, oop. I'm gonna hide this thing again here. Hide, let me, okay. okay. So let's, let's say the independent variable is the artificial diet type. I recently did a large study on pollen subs. I've done a couple of them on the pollen subs. So the test groups are going to get fed various protein patties, okay, different off-the-shelf ones in this case. The negative control gets fed an equal amount of sugar alone. So uh, what we're looking at is the difference in the patties. If you just fed patties in the control group, you didn't give them anything, somebody could say, well, they did better simply because of the sugar in the patty, not because of any other ingredient. So that means, okay, for a negative control, I got to feed them the same amount of sugar that was in the patty. So that you're not just saying it was due to the sugar in the patty, that's actually due to the patty type. A positive control might be uh, something to uh, compare it to. So what I'll do is I'll make, I'll use natural pollen with either the same weight or the same um, protein content mixed with sugar as in these, so that now I'm comparing them to something we know is a, uh, a, a good nutritional uh, for the colony. And the dependent variable of, of this would be the change in colony strength. Independent variable would be the, would be the, uh, the uh, type of diet. So you can run uh, a different, uh, three different test groups right here in order, three different uh, test groups and actually it can be more. So let's say you're doing four different diets you might have four of these and then a negative control and a positive control. Then you got to tease out the signal from the noise. And as you've probably noticed, not all colonies perform the same. Okay. You, you set up a bunch of hives in the yard and some are going to be strong. Some are going to be weak. Some are going to get mites. Some are not going to get mites. So that's really tough to tease out that signal that you're looking for from the noise. There's a, always a, lar a big group variability. So the larger the number of replicates, the more colonies in each test group, the smaller the effect you can detect. So we always ask about, well, what's your N? What's your number of replicates in each one? A general rule of thumb, there should be at least 12, if you're, if you're doing it at a colony size experiment, not on individual bees, a minimum of 10 per uh, 12 per test group. Um, it's very difficult to get any kind of results to pull out a signal from noise from less than 12 in a test group. So I did an example right here. So this is the actual data again, um, where I, I fed three different uh, pollen subs, the negative control sugar alone, the global patty right here, and a homebrew patty. So this is a histogram. It shows this is number of colonies so there's 18 colonies in each test, test group. They all have 18 uh, colonies. Um, so this, this two, the three, the four, well, these will all add up to 18. All these blues will add up to 18. All the reds will add up to 18. Here's your ending colony strength. How many frames are covered with bees? Cleared, some were cleared down to two frames covered with bees. Some were up to 14 frames covered with bees. Look at the difference in the distribution. The negative controls had a totally normal bell shape curve right here with a median value of about um, three and a half frames covered with bees. The global patties had a wider range, okay, but not a normal, not a smooth curve, but a median value here about eight frames uh, covered with bees. The homebrew patties again had a wide range, more of a normal type of curve skewed this way, but clearly more colonies up in the upper range right here. So just looking at this simple histogram distribution so that you, you just, you at you, you, you sort this out and Excel just do the histogram function will sort it out for you. This lets you say, wow, it looks like they did a lot better on the homebrew patties than they did on the negative controls right here. So let's look at some simple field trials. These are ones that I've run over the years. I just pulled a few simple ones that we go over quickly. So one question years ago, when we started doing uh, oxalic acid treatment in our nukes um, with an induced brood break, we were uh, first curious, does it actually uh, reduce the mite buildup? And I published this um, showing 
figured out theoretically that if you uh, you put in it and um, uh, the brood with a, from a uh, queen right colony in 21 days, all that brood is going to emerge. The question is, will the mites be able to go back into the brood from the new queen uh, from the queen cell? So they look at it here that she's a virgin. She emerges. She's a virgin. She gets mated. She starts laying here. It's eight days before a mite can go into a queen cell. So you have this kind of very brief overlap. So you have this treatment window. So about day 18, if you hit them with oxalic acid, you should be able to get virtually all the mites um, with it before they go into the new brood right there. So we, we um, uh, did a test and control group. We applied oxalic acid to the um, test group. And then we perform mite wash counts at four time points. And then you just plot out the difference. So here's at day zero, clear up to day 87, three months later. And we look at the difference between the ones that we um, did not do any treatment to. And the mite counts clearly went up. And I actually tried three different uh, treatments here. And the oxalic acid was the best. The mite counts were five times lower than the untreated ones after three months. So uh, very effective at reducing the mites. The question was, well, is there a trade-off? Does using the oxalic acid treatment affect the colony buildup? So go through, you start out, we cluster grade them. So we go out um, in the morning, uh, often with flashlights before the clusters break. And uh, here's my two sons. And um, we pick up the top box and one of us grades uh, the cluster size in the top box. I pick up the bottom and I see how many frames Seams are filled with bees from the bottom. Then look at the top. Then we call out our two numbers to the recorder and we grade each colony for strength. <clears throat> then after the end, at 53 days after the uh, oxalic treatment, we wanted to see if there's a difference in strength between them. So the control group, not um, a bell-shaped curve, but you can see the median value, half, half or larger, half smaller, were right here. The ones treated with oxalic acid were stronger. They had a median value of nine. It's a, so two frames strength stronger after uh, almost two months. So um, probably because they had a lower mite level. So obviously no adverse effect um, overall to colony strength. So that, that said, well, that's what we're going to do from now on. And we have now for many years. So we don't, when in our operation, we don't just start doing something because somebody says it works. We test it out first and see if we get the hard data. Hard data, hard data. We still have one more question. Would it affect honey production? So we ran a, a third experiment and we weighed all of our hives. Um, uh, back then we were using a parcel scale, uh, split them in half, weighed them, and then recorded our hive weights over the season and then average them out. So this is May 10, so the end of the honey flow in mid-July. And um, so it, we're just looking at the hive weight gain. So there's no gain from the start. You zero everything out, normalize it here. And you can see by the end of the season, the oxalic ones actually made us a little bit more, but not significantly different. So there was no effect on the amount of honey production by doing the oxalic dribble. So after these three experiments, we said, okay, we're gonna start doing oxalic acid dribbles on all of our nukes every year, which we've done now for many, many years. Okay, keep a written log. Here's the interesting thing, something, tiny detail that you may never even think is important. You may find out in retrospect was really important. I'll give you uh, an example. The researchers were looking with tracheomite. When tracheomite came through, they, it killed 70% of all hives in California. It just wiped us out. We were freaking out about tracheomite. And then some researchers were working at it in one of the USDA labs um, with tracheomite. And they were putting newly emerged bees into, petri into um, beakers with um, uh, tracheal mice to see if the tracheal mice would infect the bees. And in an insect lab, what you typically do in a beaker, you grab a little bit of Vaseline around the inside of the beaker, and that keeps the insect from crawling out of the beaker. So they put Vaseline in there. And for some reason, one group of their um, bees in the beakers did not get infected with tracheomyces, and they could not understand why they did not get infected. So they looked back in their lab notes, and that day they had run out of Vaseline. And instead of Vaseline, they said, oh, well, we'll use Crisco instead. And what they found out was 
the odor of Crisco prevented the mites from identifying a bee of the proper age to invade its trachea. And they came up with the cure for tracheal mite by pure accident. And the only way they discovered that is they looked back in their lab notes and saw they had done some tiny little detail differently on that day. So you never know how important your notes are. Don't trust your memory, not even for a moment. So when my assistants are working with me and we call out a mic count or something like that, they are not allowed to talk, look the other direction, do anything else until they have written that down. You don't, you can't, you're not allowed to, to hold something in your mind for even five seconds. So um, I type up all my uh, handwritten notes in a log book. So what I do is I keep a trial log with me writing down every day what we do. And uh, in our, I, I print out um, data sheets in advance. We put notes on the, the, the data sheets here. We're putting whether the colony strength here. And then all these things will be transcribed uh, into um, a, a document. But these are very important, all of your field notes. Record every detail. OK, some tips. Cluster grading. Very effective. Um, there's another method called Leibovitz grading, which involves pulling every frame out, and I have big issues with that one. It's very uh, disruptive to the colony, and depending on your inspectors, can be very, very inaccurate. In almond pollination, these are almond trees back here. We get paid by cluster grading, and uh, a skilled cluster grader is very, very good. My sons and I can independently look at a colony without talking, and write down our three grades, and we'll always be within a quarter frame of one another on our grading. So cluster grading can be very accurate. You look up, you see what percent, percentage of the space between the frames is filled with the bees. We do it to the nearest quarter, quarter frame. And then we write that down. For weighing, you can uh, tip them, pick them a hive up, put it on a scale. We use a digital crane scale on our overhead loaders, which works well. And then last year, I uh, took a, um, a hand truck and welded up a lever action so that you can just put the uh, cradle side up underneath the, uh, a hive, grab a handle, pull down, it lifts the hive straight up, gives you a, a weight to the 10th of a pound immediately, instantly, and lay it down so we can weigh very, very quickly. I, I love this device. I have to publish plans for it. It works really, really uh, well. But I often build custom tools for uh, doing things. Then here's Mike Palmer over in Vermont. Very simple way. You just take a postage scale, you take your hive, you tip it up on one side, and you balance it with one finger at the top. When it's balanced, all the weight is right on the scale right, right there. So you can act away with just a simple postage scale very accurately by tipping your hive until it balances on one corner. Sticky boards. Um, I make I custom make these um, uh, with a uh, uh, use my regular bottom board and <clears throat> move the B-way um, uh, from the back to the front here so I can slide the sticky board in the, from the back without bothering the bees. Um, uh, um, the best ones we make is out of the, um, the Cortex um, uh, shower stall uh, plastic from the hardware store. It works really well, it uh, stays nice and flat. Before you put any grease on it, take a, a black uh, marks a lot, marks a lot, Felt pen works the best, better than Sharpie, better than any other brand. Mark's Life Felt Pen, draw a grid on it. And then that stays on there for years, even with the grease and everything. Um, we use a thin paint roller with a, a mixture of uh, Vaseline and mineral oil, very light roll over, and then you scrape it off with a drywall knife very quickly um, to get sticky board uh, counts. Um, and also a hand clicker, so you don't, you don't want to say, oh, my God, where was I? Was that mite number 492 or was that 429? I better start all over again. So using a clicker helps counter, helps a whole lot with your mite counts. And you see, writing them all down on your data sheet. Okay, using mite washes uh, here. Sugar roll, um, very inaccurate, inconsistent, so we, we don't. Uh, use this any anymore. Um, the best we found is either 91% alcohol or uh, Don detergent. 
um, uh, which works very, very well. And for counting, we use a, a six inch diameter, 10X magnifying mirror, it's placed about four inches below the cup, and then it makes it really easy to accurately identify and count, count the mites. Um, and then if you're gonna take your mite washes, whoops, you can't take it from any random frame. And we, I've, I, I published this of whether you should take them from a brood comb, a comb with bee bread, comb with honey, or just a drawn comb, and then the average for the entire um, hive, the, all the combs. And what we, we found is that the combs um, that are alongside the brood, as, a, as opposed to the brood, look at the huge variability of the, uh, in, in the brood combs. Okay, you get some really sky high numbers and low ones, whereas um, the, the combs that are next to the um, brood are more representative of the overall uh, colony uh, 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 mite infestation rate. So we don't disturb the, the brood frames. We take all of our mite counts from the first comb alongside the brood nest. And um, uh, so you just want to standardize what, what you do. Then we shake them in a tub. We let the older bees fly out. The older bees have a lower mite infestation rate than the younger bees. And I've determined that experimentally also. And now what's left is younger bees from a comb that did not contain brood. And they give you a very representative mite count for the colony. Then we level off exactly a half cup of bees. I have done this 10,000 times and never gotten stung on the finger by doing that. These young bees do not sting you at all. You just brush them off with your finger, get a level half cup. And I've seen data from some researchers and they said, well, let's do our, how many bees, where they have the students actually count how many bees were in their half cup and they get anywhere from 150 to 350. And I said, you guys, that's ridiculous. Those are inconsistent samples. We want all of our samples to be dead level half cups. The thing that's really revolutionized us is, is I built a bunch of these mechanical agitators. And, and um, I'm going to be, um, I'm working on generation four now. And I hope to just publish the plans for these soon. And this really helps you to standardize your mite wash uh, counts. Um, you may need to get a pesticide research uh, permit. Uh, I need to get this for the state of California every year to work on the extended release oxalic acid. Um, take a lot of photos. Photos are better than words. So when you're doing your experiments, take photos of everything you do. And it really helps in your presentation for people to understand what you did. Identify your hives very clearly. I find these, um, these are plastic restaurant place markers, very cheap on, on Amazon get a pack of one to a hundred. So very easy to staple these or, or thumbtack these to your hives and clearly identify your hives. You don't ever want to put them on the lid because you might swap lids. They should be attached either to the face of the hive or the uh, uh, landing board. If you're going to run uh, compare growth of colonies, I put five frames into a box and leave the other frames out temporarily put the same number of frames of brood in every one, put a drawn comb and a frame of honey out, out here. And then you take the lids off every day. And the ones that are, are weak, you add bees from some backup hives, you shake them in and the young bees will stay, or you remove bees from the strong ones and you equalize them until all the hives have the same coverage on the outside comb of bees. Now your hives are all, all equalized. And then at that point, you can drop in your frames of drawn comb on either side and you've started with all the colonies at the same strength. Okay, recording your data. Like I said, logbook, and I, I print off custom data sheets for the field. I put them on either heavy card stocks, so they don't flop around, or if it's gonna be raining on waterproof paper. So everyone, right, just print these off and it makes it your data collection very good. Put down the date, the yard you're at, who actually helped you out, the time point, what you're measuring, and any notes. And then transfer all that data to Excel so that you can then go ahead and, and, and graph it out. Okay, now we get to the tough part. Sharing your results with everybody else. And that is you got to help your eyes and brain to tease out meaning from a bunch of numbers. 
<laughs> have mercy on your audience. Avoid showing results in tables. This just will put an audience of beekeepers to sleep right here. You look at this, you go, oh my God, you just go into brain overload. Now, let me show you the same data right here as a graph. Was there any difference between the control and the supplemented colony? Very easy, see, no, no, no difference. Look how tiny the error bars are, okay? So very good data set. But compare that to looking at this. How long do you have to stare at this to see if there's a difference between the two test groups? A simple graph like this is way better. The human brain prefers pictures rather than numbers. And the standard now is all your scientists like to do these, these uh, box plots right here with your, your means and, and standard errors. And they just make my head swim. I would much rather just show the raw data. So here's raw data. This is for every single hive in this trial with your starting mite count, mites per half cup of bees in the blue, and your ending mite count in the red. So you can see how much it changed. In this group, clearly, there's a lot more blue than red that the mite counts went down across the board. This tells me which yard they were in. Each of these uh, letters indicates a different yard. So the beekeeper can look at this and go, oh yeah, okay, I can see there's a difference. And then I, for the last one, I calculated the median value. So the half, halfway, half more, half less. And the and median value for all these guys was a median reduction to 10% of the starting count. So this is just straight raw data right here, way better than box plots and stuff, as far as beekeepers are concerned. Now, I mentioned the word median. So here's the raw data right here, the number of mites per half cup of bees from zero to 30 across this group of hives right here. This is actual field data right here. Now, the problem is, is outliers. You got a couple of colonies with really high mite counts. They really skew the mean. The mean is the average, the arithmetical average. So the mean value, mean mite count right here is 6.3 mites for the whole group. But the median value, which means that half the highs were, were higher and half the highs were lower, is way down here, two and a half mites. So from the beekeeper standpoint, if you want to, when you say average, which average? One super high mite colony can skew your average, one outlier, your mean a lot. So I prefer to use median values in most of my analyses right here. Because we look at, here's the, there were um, 30 hives. The lowest count, three hives had counts of zero. The highest one was 26. That's a huge range. And that's what really skews your mean, your average value here. Okay, that's, this is the same data right here. So this data set, they're lined up right here. Here's a histogram saying how many were each one. So if you were a beekeeper, you'd say, oh, well, most of my colonies have very low my counts. I'm not that worried right here. We had a few outliers out there. Going back to the same data set, you can compare that. So this is why I, I like the histograms a lot right here. Because for a beekeeper's practical perspective, this tells you a lot. Most of my hives are here. I say I have a few outliers up here. If you're gonna make a graph, make sure you explain everything of what everything is. Now, this one looks pretty complicated. This is for every hive of the, of the groups. So you have um, control hives, seven day treatment, 14 day treatment hives. And here I made it a, a little simpler. So this, this is your, um, Oh, I want to. Take, I worked on this last time. I want to take that other one out of here. Um, so this, these two are show exactly the same data. This is your for all the hives right here. These are your averages um, right here. Um, so, oh, wow! I replaced this one. Okay, I thought I changed these. I just called these treatment A and treatment B here. So. So this would be your um, control was blue, treatment A and treatment B. So two different ways of looking at it. So you can, you can do it yourself and see how you want to present that. Make it, make it simple so beekeepers can see. I showed you this one before, a combination of both the individual uh, columns and the cumulative. So you'd use two things on the same graph. Um, error bars. So you can do standard errors of the mean. So this means, there was a lot of variation of the control group 
okay? So it's hard to compare things when you have a big error bars. You're much better if you have small error bars right here. So you can see the APIGARD uh, treatment had very small error bars. It was very, very consistent, whereas the controls had huge variation in their uh, mite, mite counts. And then histograms, okay? So this was uh, data from um, uh, pounds gained uh, by a uh, colony. So total number of hives right here. So three hives in this, in this uh, up to a pound gained, uh, four hives, 1.1 1, 1 up to 1.5 pounds. We did a little bit of syrup feeding to see uh, the difference right here. And very clear uh, difference between the, uh, the two groups, the control group and the fed group right here. So histogram really makes it really clear to your eyes what the difference is. Okay, same data in all three charts. Your choice. Ask 20 people right now. You're going to have seven people say, oh, I like, like this one. Seven people, I like this one. Seven people, I like this one. It's really up to you to figure out this is exactly the same data right here in three different types of charts. So you take your time and figure out which one you think best represents it. I spent a lot, a lot of time on my charts. When I, when I do an experiment, get my data, I'll spend hours and hours and hours figuring out just the right chart, putting it up, putting it up in a PowerPoint. Like, oh no, that's not clearly labeled. I got to change the, the y-axis labels. I got to change the legend right here. I got to change the x-axis. Oh, I need to change the title so it's more explanatory. Take a lot of time. If you've been to very many bee conventions, especially with scientists, they get up there, they start throwing tables and charts at you. And by the time you even figure out what their axes mean, they're already going on to the next slide. So I see these audience of beekeepers going, oh man, I didn't learn a damn thing from that presentation. Spend a lot of time on your charts and make them for the beekeepers who you are going to try to share your data with. And then there's scattergrams to show whether there's a, um, uh, you, you're looking at um, two different uh, metrics, like the before count, the after count, the treatment, uh, and the resulting something. And you look for a correlation. So if, if you put a regression line on, so there's no correlation here. If they line up, there's a, a correlation. And so I'll show you a couple of these. So here's a scattergram right here. This is your um, uh, bees um, uh, measured, colonies measured over winter. Each one of these dots indicates one colony. This is your spore count uh, for Nozema spores on December 20th. And here's your percent loss from the starting strength uh, earlier in the uh, season. And that, that details would, would all be there. And you can see there was almost no correlation. R squared is your percent of the variation explained by this regression line. So only 4% was explained by this. You're looking for an R squared value much higher, like 50%, 0.5 would be meaningful. So there wasn't a correlation between the uh, Nozema spore count on December 20th and your loss in colony strength over winter. This, this informed me how much I should worry about Nozema. This says, don't worry about it. Now, on the other hand, I uh, recently published this one where I was uh, predicting based upon the amino acid deficiencies in the pollen subs um, and uh, their performance. So this is your, out of the 18 hives, the total number of frames of bees out of that group that went to almond pollination. So out of the um, 18 uh, hives, we took 130 frames of the home group, brew group. The control groups are the... Uh, uh, the healthy bee group, <laughs> out of those 18 highs, we got 40 frames, huge difference. But look at the R squared value. 82% of the correlation was based upon the amino acid deficiency. So this is, means this is, does not look to be a spurious correlation. Uh, and when I calculated the, um, your, your um, um, probability, this is four chances out of 100 of getting this kind of correlation, which means this actually meant something. This was enough that I could tell the manufacturers, I think I got some here, guys. I think if you look at your amino acid deficiencies, you can make a whole lot better pollen subs. And anybody that looks at this graph goes, oh my God, 
you could have told us before you even did this trial, based upon our analyses, how well our pollen subs were going to perform. So this really got, really got their interest. Now this one, this one is a really busy one, but I, I like it because if you look at the look at the healthy bee group, this is um, so your endpoints. Uh, uh, this is your midpoint strength for the colonies in frames of bees, eight frame uh, uh, here, ten framers. Here's your endpoint strength, and there was a clear correlation between the uh, midpoint strength and the endpoint uh, strength. This would be your no change. So any ones above got stronger. Any ones below got weaker. Look at the colors of the dots. What color pollen sub tended to get weaker? See all the greens down here? The green group tended to get weaker. Which one tended to get stronger? Oh, look at these red ones up here, the homebrew up here, and the um, global right here, the, the blue circles right here. So you can look at this and you can really go, your eye can pick out those patterns. You can learn something and say, yeah, you know, you don't have to tell me about standard deviations and, and means and meetings and stuff. I can look at this right here and say, boy, am I going to feed a pollen sub? I'm going to feed these colors, these red or blue, not the white controls or the green, uh, this other one down here. And this is, by doing this yourself, you may... This may inform you going, oh, wow, I should analyze deeper and look at things because this shows me a pattern right here that now I can start teasing things out. And this is statistics. <laughs> and what I see, the more statistics a researcher uses, the less, the less I trust their results. Um, so um, what they all have to do is they have to get a p-value, a probability value that they want to have a p-value of less than 5%, 0 0.05. Um, that means that one time out of 20, that could happen by chance, okay? If they had a p-value of 0 0.01, that means one time out of 100, it would happen by chance. Um, and that's called a, a very strong um, uh, uh, significance. Um, so you can use um, students' t-test for normal distributions, the man whitney Q-test calculator. So these distributions were not normal. So I used the Mann-Whitney calculator. And it says the difference between these group weights. So this is your number of hives, and here's your pounds gained. And you go, wow, I can't tell whether, whether it, it, it looks like maybe the reds are a bit, bit better, but the controls, you have these two really weak outliers. Does that make a difference? And what it says is the p-value is 0.38. That means a third of the time, more than a third of the time, you would get this just by random, ran, random, uh, uh, randomness based upon the difference, uh, the, the variability in here. The result is not significant at probably a less of 0 0.05. Okay. The null hypothesis versus the medians of the two samples are identical. So this is, this is the test that you, you would do that helps you if your eye can't pick out. You've seen some of these histograms so far this evening where it was very clear that the red group was different from the blue group. This one, you wouldn't want to run statistics to see if there was a, a difference. And sometimes the linear regression that, they, that is calculated out here, so this is your mites per half cup of bees, your, out, your mite wash count, and there's your 24 hour mite drop. And you see there's very, very poor correlation. And when I did it, plotted out the linear regression from in Excel, it only predicted 6% of the, of the placement. But if I look at it with my eyeball, I go, you know what? Actually, I think this one right here, that's like three times, I made it up, I put it in and said, three times your mite wash count. So this, this put your mite drop at three times. And actually, I think that was a better fit than the linear regression. Gives you an idea. And this tells you how hard it is to correlate the mite wash count to the um, natural mite drop count. There's the, I see scientists over and over again try to come up with a number. You can't come up with a firm number. The, the two of them are totally different uh, things that are happening in the hive. Okay, we're getting near the end here. Um, incubator trials. I make my own incubators out of uh, old upright freezers. Um, they work really well. You put in, I use a hair dryer, uh, a low wattage hair dryer uh, inside, uh, and um, 
use these cup cages. I came up with this design, and this design is now used by, by um, the USDA labs um, for all their, their research. Uh, so here's a cage trial one. Um, I was curious to uh, do the Pettis test uh, for amitraz resistance for mites. I didn't know how much of a strip of apivar I should put into a cup. And then I said, wow, a lot of beekeepers say, well, how long are those apivar strips good for? Because it says that after two weeks on the package, you should throw them away once you open the package. And I said, I don't know why uh, amitraz doesn't evaporate. It should be good for a while. And so I noticed on the floorboards of my truck, there was an old apivar strip that had been kicking around for some months after it had been in a hive for uh, a, a dead out for over a year. So I said, well, let's test uh, an old beat up one against brand new ones. And uh, so I hung these strips underneath the, um, the lids right here and put a, uh, a, a 30 milliliter scoop of bees into each cup and then put them all into the incubator at um, uh, normal hive temperature and humidity. And then you count your fallen mites at four, six and 24 hours. And then I did took the, um, uh, took the bees and did a, a mite wash counts, uh, washes on them uh, <clears throat> until they washed them over and over again until I got zero mite recovery anymore. So I can see how many mites uh, were still surviving. And you plot it out right here. So in the control groups, after 24 hours, you still had almost 90% of your mites left. A one inch piece of Amitraz uh, strip um, uh, it dropped down uh, qu quite a bit. This is no contact. So this was uh, placed um, below a screen. So the bees, uh, I was curious whether there was any vapor action. And I had, my hypothesis was there would be no vapor action. And this experiment showed me I was <laughs> wrong on that one. There actually is a vapor action from the amitraz. It's not very strong, but I did get more mites dropping from the no contact. And then either a piece of a half inch wide strip or one inch wide strip didn't make any difference. And then the, um, uh, a, uh, a one, <laughs> the piece of the aged old strip was still as good as the new strip um, as far as your mite drop. So that was uh, another surprising finding. So for your applied science questions, practical benefits, does it increase colony strength or colony survival, weight gain, burrow accounts, Nozema, or does it save you time or money? So these are the type of experiments that are worthwhile actually doing. Let's see. How much time have we done so far, Bill? I could, I, I could show you um, that that's pretty much cover the nitty gritty. I just threw in some, I think one more trial up to you guys. Uh, maybe another five, maybe five more another minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, we'll try this. Okay, so here's a comparative trial of the pollen subs. Um, I, I replicated this in three different test yards. You wanna see if you get the same results in each yard so that uh, otherwise you really don't know if you do it all in one yard, whether you get the same result again. You really wanna replicate experiments. Anything that's only been done in one study, I question. Like there's a study out there that everybody cites. One researcher said, did a cage trial said, oh, Varroa can't reproduce if the humidity is above 80% in the hive. Well, crap, that would mean most beekeepers in the Southeast during summer, Varroa would not be able to reproduce because the bees could not possibly get the humidity down below 80%. Nice of it, that, that research must be wrong. I see it co continually. Um, uh, being cited by people. Can you hear me? It's, I just got a warning about microphone here. You still hear me, Bill? Oh, nod your head if you're hearing me. Okay. Okay, so when I set this one up for the pollen sub, I did a randomized block design. Okay. So I blocked them um, first by, by the... Um, um, starting strength. So I, I, I graded all the highs in the yard for starting strength. And then I had eight different treatments. So the eight strongest hives, I randomly assigned the treatments to. Then you block it. They're going to the next block of the second eight strong, second strong. So this is frames of bees. So the strongest, they're sorted by frames of bees. So block one, 
is the strongest ones right here. You apply the treatments, then randomly assign them to it using a random number generator. Then you're blocked to the next eight strongest, and you again randomly assign the eight treatments. That's called randomized block design. And sometimes I'll block them twice, first by maybe my count and then by strength or something like that. That means sure that you, uh, you evenly apply the treatments. And then we color coded our treatments. We're, we, you want to be blinded. You don't want to even know the name of anything. So we just put colored tape on here and put colored tags on the um, hives to uh, randomize them. Replicate the trial in three yards. Uh, when, it, when there's um, uh, very little uh, pollen flow and we record everything, recorded everything that happened so that the beekeepers can look when you were feeding, when you weren't feeding, when there was a dearth, when there was a pollen flow. We record the temperatures, uh, temperature highs, the humidity lows from a person, you, you can download yeah. that data from a personal weather station. We weighed any, any uneaten sub and then we cluster graded in, in cool weather. Notice all the photographs really help. If you're going to show your results to a beekeeping audience, beekeepers would rather see what you're doing in the field. And that, 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 that resonates with them. And then final results of your difference of performance. Of, these are the different patties. And here's your total number of frames of bees that you get paid for. So every frame of bees here, I get $25 in almonds. You start adding this up, it makes a big difference. And then I dug a little deeper, trying to figure out why the difference was looking, looking at your sugar, looking at your fat, looking at protein, and then looking at your essential amino acids. And that's where I, I, I figure it out um, what the result was. And there we go. <laughs> End of show. Stop sharing. All right. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can. Oh, yeah. good. It we works. Yeah. All right. Let me go. Hey, wait, yeah. wait. First, the test on everything. <laughs> Just kidding. We're gonna go with the uh, what's in the chat here. Let's see, what's the um, what's your mixture for your for your sticky board? Your Vaseline versus uh, mineral oil? No, oh, it's um, the two uh, containers. One was a, a pint, and one was thirteen ounces. Just it's the the two off the shelf ones. It's on my website. If you, uh, if you, there's a search function on my website, if you just search for the word Vaseline, it'll tell you the mixture. And you just heat it up slightly on, the, on a stove and it, they, dissolve, they mix together very easily, pour them back into the jars and really easy to scoop out and roll on with the roller. And you want a very, very thin layer. You don't want to group them up. Good question, Ken. Because a lot of what we do is might wash this alcohol might wash and the importance of the alcohol might wash to do one consistently accurately. Yeah, that's the key thing. Do, is there a, a procedure, a method of you swirl twice, agitate once, hold it for five minutes? I mean, to do it consistently every time uh -huh. to get accurate results. Yes, so what we, what we do, we have found, we used to use alcohol. We no longer use alcohol. The reason is the dawn, if you, you wait one minute after you dump the bees in, before you do any agitation at all, half your mice will have already fallen by then, uh, much better than with the, um, um, the alcohol. The, the alcohol will cause them to release, but they don't precipitate to the mites, uh, to the bees. Uh, the bees keep moving for a little bit in the dawn, and that allows the mice to precipitate. Then you oh. never want to shake up and down. If you shake them down, you just keep stirring the mice back up into the bees. You only want to do a, enough agitation that the mice can jiggle down, precipitate down through the bee's body. So a gentle swirl uh, works best. And then you want to do a time. So in ours, we use the mechanical agitators. We push a button and it automatically gives us 300 uh, swirls. Um, and then it stops. So we, and we've calibrated these uh, until we get 95% um, percent, uh, recovery consistently. Um, uh, when we push the button. Uh, and so that helps a lot. Otherwise, you have to do it by, by hand, which means you want to use the stopwatch and, and swirl them for the same amount of time. With the dawn, it does not take much um, um, uh, agitation. Okay, you don't have to do any up and down again, just gentle swirling and, and you get really good mite recovery. Side note on that, Don, what's your, what's your ratio, water to, 
to this soap? Uh, it's one tablespoon per, we mix it up in half gallon jars, so one tablespoon per half gallon. And it's, it's not critical. If you cut that down to half of that, you don't get as good recovery. If you double it, it doesn't make any difference. It makes it just slipperier. So one tablespoon per half gallon works very well. Don, Don Ultra. And um, uh, I'll answer your question in a second, Ralph. Um, uh, we've tried other detergents and you read it on my website. Not all detergents work the same. I haven't tested every detergent on the market, but I can tell you Don Ultra works very well. Um, the swirling, the time is not as important as the amount of movement, Ralph. So we, our time, we use a 300 RPM um, uh, motor. Um, so we have 300 revolutions in 60 seconds. So we, we, we get our might washes are time for, we, I design our machines that we get the result in a 95% recovery in 60 seconds. Please scroll up the, the chat there, see if there's any more questions up top. Anybody else got questions here? I, had, I wrote down a bunch of questions and as you went by, you answered all my questions, so. Okay. Absolute for presentation. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, doing bee research is so much fun. You gotta have, if, if you only have a few hives, then do an observational study or something small or incubator study or something like that. For a field trial, you need to have more hives. Like I said, you have to have at least 12 in a group and, and more than that, 18 or 24 is, is better. So that takes it, you either have to have um, a larger beekeeper to collaborate with or, um, or combine your hives into one apiary. You did mention earlier in the presentation, you said you used a fluorescent tracer uh, probably oh, yeah. it was in uh, in some pollen sub or something. Yeah. What is lot, that? How does that work? What What about it? What What is the fluorescent tracer, and how does How do you? Oh, I, I've tested out a bunch of different uh, fluorescent tracers. You get them um, from Blacklight.com, and uh, different powders. Um, they're and and they're first. You have to test them and make sure they're non toxic to the bees. So I have a number of them that I've tested. You know, but by feeding them, they cage bees and make sure they're not toxic to them. The second thing, they come with different particle sizes. So depending on how you're using them, you've got to determine which particle size you want. But the most important thing is if you're doing it for like uh, looking at the guts of bees to see if they're eating something, first take the bees, put them under black light and see what color their natural pollen glows. And what I found time and time again, you could put a, a like a, a, a orange fluorescent tracer in there and damned if they don't start eating a natural pollen that glows orange or you put a white one in and they then do that. So what I've learned is have, so I have blue, orange, red, yellow, white tracers. So first I check the bees, see what, 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 what colors their guts are naturally fluorescing and then choose a fluorescent tracer that is a different color and it, it, um, sometimes I actually have to look under a microscope because to tease out which one is not. In general, though, you just go into it, uh, put them in it. Um, I have a, a little uh, hallway. I can close all the doors in, make it pitch black and bring in a black light in there. And, it's, and generally, it's very, very clear whether or not they have the fluorescent tracer in them or not. Or you take the whole comb. And if you're seeing it like if they're packing them in the combs with the bee bread. Boy, you pull that comb out, brush the bees off, put it in a dark room and put the black lines on it. It's, it's obvious where the bees are storing uh, what you fed them in the field. We had a question there about uh, what program do you use to make your graphs? I use Excel. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with Excel. I'm happy with Excel 2010. <laughs> I don't like the new, I don't know how Microsoft does it, but they can take the a simplest, good nice working program and make it worse every time they do an upgrade to make it worse i don't know why they do that all right how about can he see those yeah can he see the questions here's another one whitewash question yeah uh, from Amy says, my protocol is to collect all my samples in my side, side lantern sized apiary and label the jars and leave the bees in the alcohol at least 24 hours, uh, more likely a week. 
I've been using 90% since I first hear your study, but it sounds like 80% alcohol might work as well as 90% given my protocol. Yeah, it sounds like you probably answered it. So don't use alcohol, use, use dish use soap. Dog. Well, if you, if you do that, you can't keep them for a week. Oh, actually, the reason, hold on, this is my question. The reason I use the alcohol is because I later do a nosema analysis, so I want them preserved in alcohol. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you're trying to preserve them, yeah, you got to use the alcohol. So preserving, I think you said 70% is better, but my question was- No, no, not, no, I, no, not better. 70% is like minimum for preserving. Okay. Okay, because I've been using 90 and I just wanted to know because you said that they precipitated out faster at the 90. But if I was leaving them for a week, I didn't know if I still needed to use yeah, that. Yeah, what I, I find with, with, with older samples, even at 70, they start to degrade. And the, um, so if you're going to store them for a while, yeah, I'd probably go with the, the, the higher proof alcohol. Okay, thanks. You bet. About uh, the weight gain. You mentioned yeah. to, to weigh hives. Now, obviously, honey is the most dense and it's going to create the most weight. Uh, do you figure out how much of that weight is also bees or brood or, uh, or pollen or wax? Dep depends upon what you're interested in. So if I'm looking at just to see the weight gain, I'm using it as the final calculus of colony performance, which means total weight. Uh, tells you how well the colony did. If you, you start off with, with a, your starting weight, you set that at zero. Anything that's gained mean the bees were, if they're, they're successful. If they're not successful, they cannot gain weight in any form, either in bee bodies, in comb, in beeswax, uh, in stored pollen, in, or in honey. So if you want to look at one metric to look at the success of a colony, total weight gain is a, a good metric. Okay. Yeah, it's much easier. I mean, trying to separate out honey where I see experiments is, well, well, we harvested this much honey. Well, what the, that is so subjective. What do you harvest? <laughs> so now if you say, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to harvest, you define it and you say, well, we're going to we're going to weigh whatever is above the queen excluder. Well, that's possible. What if one colony just had bees will preferentially store honey first below the queen excluder? before they store it above. So if a colony was lighter in weight, had more empty comb below the quinic loader, they could store as much honey down there as they stored in the, up before they put any in the upper boxes. So measuring honey is much more subjective than just measuring total weight. There's no sub subjectivity. That's an objective measurement. There's also the last thing I think in all this, and nobody else has questions here, uh, is your Homebrew recipe for your pollen sub. Uh, how do we find that? Look at my website. Yep. So it's all up there. It's yeah. I put it right in on the. Um, it wasn't my. It wasn't my formula, um, but I did publish it in my. I think the. I think the last article has already. Oh, it may not be on my website yet. It got published. God. No, I think. I, I have an assistant who, who posts after I publish an ABJ, they want me to wait for two months before I put stuff onto the website. And, and, and I've written it two months before it gets published. So when people ask me what's on my website or what's up, you know, that's four months behind four months is an eternity to me because I've already moved on to other projects and written whole new papers and everything like that. So I, 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 I don't always keep track of what, what's up, but two months after it's published in ABJ, I put all the articles on my website. I have another question. Regarding the commercial pollen substitutes. Yeah. Taking those results that you have and gone back to the manufacturer and showed them results, <clears throat> would we anticipate some changes in their formulary uh, coming up soon? That, well, what's your opinion of the intelligence of the manufacturers? <laughs> <laughs> But they're all aware. I'll, I'll tell you right now, there are some, yes, that have already, um, we almost ran a, a, a trial because they're going to, and we'll probably do it. Uh, uh, any, I'm happy to collaborate with anybody if they do something for the benefit of the industry. So um, we, we, were, we were going to run a trial last year and they, you know, things came up. It wasn't one of their priorities. And it's not, not my job to, to put a fire under them. So, um, uh, 
uh, my guess is we'll probably be running a, a trial this summer uh, with them. Because I'll tell you right now, the manufacturers um, noticed a shift in purchasing <laughs> after I published that. Um, yeah. 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 So, so some, some, one of the companies goes, oh, my God, my son went down to buy some from their company, which we hadn't been bought from before. And they said, oh, Eric Oliver, you Randy's son? <laughs> Is it? He says, yeah. He goes, wow, Deb, your article just changed everything for us. <laughs> so um, yeah, they, 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 they did notice. But see, I, I, I am totally unbiased. I, I have no, you know, dog in the fight at all for anybody. I, I work for the beekeepers alone and, and I'm happy to share with the manufacturers. Um, um, I just want to have better products on the market for the beekeepers. And it's up to the manufacturers if they want to step up to the plate. Yep, spend enough time on your, uh, on your graphs and anybody will listen. Yep. <laughs> I have another question. Keep going, Ken. Keep going. Yeah. This is a little bit off topic for this presentation, but your 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 persistent uh, study on the oxalic glycerin. Yeah. Where are where are you in in finalizing your uh, vehicle for transmission? I guess. Um, we're getting close right now. I, I've got, I just sent off uh, the, my update um, article to ABJ um, last, last week, and I have one more follow-up following that. So what I did is I tested a number of different matrices um, this, this uh, summer. And then after I came up with ones that I liked, I tested them at different um, surface areas uh, per hive. Um, so the Swedish sponge, um, a full Swedish sponge, about 55 square inches, gives very good mic control. But we had a question because we had treated some hives with, when they were smaller with only a quarter sponge strip and it's, it looks like it was good. So we treated hives with anywhere from one, we, we cut the Swedish sponges into four strips and we applied either one strip, two strips, three strips or four strips um, to them. And, um, and uh, you know what, I'm trying to think if I have it right handy here to show you the results. Anyway, it turned out um, three quarters of a sponge surface area gives good mic control and one full sponge surface area gives very good mic control. And then I also tested um, um, the, um, the Argentine formulation, and, which is also used in New Zealand. Uh, and they use different ratios of oxalic acid to glycerin. Um, we like the one-to-one -one ratio for the handling characteristics. The uh, uh, New Zealanders or the uh, Argentinas use a one to 2.5 ratio, very heavy on the glycerin. And I notice adverse effects with that. The New Zealanders use a one to um, 1 1.5 ratio. Um, um, they all work, but what I found what was surprising, you would think that if you hung the strips, the cardboard strips down between the frames, four strips per box, you can get by with less surface area than with the sponges. And that's not the case. It takes considerably more surface area with the hung strips than it does just laying a sponge across the top bars. Makes no sense at all, but the data shows it takes less surface area with the sponges just laid across the top bars. And, and the reason that we're, we're interested in that is my son pointed out, dad, there's no way in the world we're going to put four strip cardboard strips per brood chamber into 1,500 hives and then take them out afterwards. That's just way too much labor. Give me something we can crack the box and toss something in and close the boxes up. So that's why I'm working on, um, I'm, I'm not pursuing the hung strip method so much. We're using the um, something laid across the top bars. And we did have a, I did have a meeting with EPA uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, to see about progress, to see if they would follow the New Zealand model. New Zealand has an own use exemption, which says beekeepers are allowed to use generic oxalic acid or formic acid in their hives any way they want, as long as they're not selling a formulated product. And I said, wow, that would sure make it easy for us. <laughs> With EPA, would you be uh, consider doing that and make it easier for everybody to get your, you know, take, you know, cover your own ass 
And they said, uh, they can't do that. We have to get a law passed, uh, a change to FIFRA. So if anybody knows a congressman who wants to pick it up and say, hey, let's do an own use exemption for beekeepers, boy, that would make our life a lot easier. All right, we got time for maybe uh, one more question if anybody's got one. And then we got to move on to just kind of club stuff. Anybody out there in the, uh, the Zoom land? Yeah, I had asked the question, Randy, when do you prefer uh, sticky boards versus alcohol washes? Um, well, it depends on what, 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 what's your objective? Uh, might count. For what? For, 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 for determining when you have to treat your hives? Uh, yes. Okay, so your objective is to monitor your hives for a rural level to determine whether or not to treat them. Sticky boards are, um, uh, might wash is way more informative than sticky board counts. Okay, thanks. All right, well, thank you, Randy. You bet. That was, right. that was good. good. Good questions, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, some local stuff here. So, okay. Another, I'll, uh, say good, I'll say good night to you guys. Get myself some dinner. Thank you, Randy. Okay, doke. All right. See ya. Thank you. And as far as everyone else goes out there, whoever's not.